Well, it's it's good to be able to welcome tonight uh, Di Hankey. He's from Wales. He's a real Welshman, as you'll hear. But it's quite interesting because he's been in, involved in, in trying to help people caught up in sort of modern day slavery. I'd like to ask you a little bit about that, Di, but welcome. Good to see you. What exactly is a modern day slave? Well, it's good to be with you, Roger. Thanks so much for the invite. And yeah, modern day slavery um, is something which is increasingly uh, becoming part of what the you know a part of the public conscience um it, when people historically thought of slaves they thought of the transatlantic slave trade you know all those yeah. years ago um shipping uh men and women and children across the atlantic from africa and the subcontinent um to the uk and the us but certainly now um modern day slavery has a much more um uh, broad and, and a much more diverse kind of um face Modern day slavery is essentially um, the uh, the enslavement of men, women, and children uh, for various uh, illicit purposes. My my personal definition is it's the exploitation of the vulnerable by the powerful. So wherever there are those who have power, uh, mm. and they, they exert it over those who are who are um, vulnerable in some way, um, that can uh, come in many forms. Is sexual exploitation women traffic into the sex trade uh, there can be criminal exploitation people trafficked into um uh illegal um industries such as cannabis cultivation it's actually terrifying how much cannabis in the uk is grown by vietnamese children in mm -hmm. um in terrace houses that look just like a normal house from the outside um mm -hmm. so th that'd be criminal exploitation there's forced labor which is people being forced to work in legitimate employment but either not getting paid or kept in squalid conditions that can be things like factories that can be things like agriculture nail bars car washes those sorts of places mm -hmm. there are still domestic there's domestic servitude is another form of um, modern day slavery those who are just literally forced to live in a home and just work as a servant or a slave for free um often being sexually abused as part of that um work as well then there's um, things really, uh, really disturbing. One is called organ harvesting, where people are literally trafficked and their 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 organs are taken from them and sold on the black market. There's um, that's an increasing issue. Um, and in the UK, there's a, a form of modern slavery called county lines that you might see coming up on the news more and more, which is to do with young young people and vulnerable people being dragged into the um, the drug trade, being forced to run drugs, sell drugs um, in the inner cities, normally. Um, uh, under the kind of auspices of, of gangs in larger cities like London or Liverpool or Birmingham who have kind of saturated the market there. And so they send their younger gang members, often just like teenagers, to go and try and muscle in on the uh, drug trade uh, in uh, in smaller towns and seaside resorts across the UK and the fear of um, punishment if they don't come back with, with money and uh, a new drug market. So that's another form of modern day slavery. So yeah, it's, um, it, it's, it's pretty, um, pretty bleak. It's estimated that globally there's about 48 million slaves in the world. Really? really? Which, and, and what about in the UK? In the UK, um, a very conservative estimate would be there's about 13,000. You know, that, that's the kind of uh, one of the official figures, but many think it's about 10 times that um, mm -hmm. if you take it all into consideration. But 48 million people in the world being a slave equates to one in every 200 people on planet Earth is living in some form of uh, slavery or servitude. So it's pretty, pretty huge. And what are you able to do, Di, to, to help? I mean, there's a lot of practical things that can be done. Raising awareness, stuff like this, even talking about it is, mm. is one thing and telling people to go and find out what to look for and then, you know, just sort of phone the police if they've got any concerns. Um, and a lot of what I do um, is we help on the kind of the response end. So we don't do a lot of, you know, we don't do anything around rescue. We don't do anything around prosecution. Um, we do things around if people have been, um, uh, have suffered as you know, some form of slavery and have been rescued, we then are involved in many ways helping them to rebuild their lives. So I run a, a charity called Red Community. Uh, it's, it's Wales focused. All, all I do is based in Wales. Yeah. Um, and Red Community um, does several things. It offers small grants uh, you know, for emergency funding to help people get clothing, get education, get counseling if they need it, that sort of stuff. We also have a befriending project where we um, train up um, Christians from local churches to just um, get alongside uh, primarily women uh, who uh, who've been rescued and now trying to rebuild their lives living in you know just in the community 
but are just, you know, need support in community. I think we've got about 50 um, befrienders trained up in South Wales, um, you know, who at various stages have spent, you know, significant amount of time with uh, with women who've been trafficked uh, and um, have suffered in that way. And the other thing I do, which some people know me for, um, is myself and one of the one of the other trustees of Red Community, a friend of mine called Nick's, um, set up a business called Manumit Coffee Roasters. And so we uh, provide employment to people who've been trafficked and they're trying to rebuild their lives and want to get back into work, but going straight back into a nine to five after having, you know, uh, suffered in the way they have, is just too much. Mm-hmm. So we, the whole uh, onus at Manumit is to create a loving and a caring and a, a gracious environment where we can be a, almost a stepping stone back into re-engaging with the real world. And so like, that's another thing that we do as well. Uh, I think you also write children's books, but we'll come back to that later on. How did you get involved in all of this day? It's a crazy thing. I mean, I'm sure we'll get to the fact that I'm a follower of Jesus and how that happened yeah. in a minute. But um, about um, almost 10 years ago now, I had a, a very, very dramatic encounter where I was I was in a, a, a worship service and in ways that would probably freak some people out if they're not used to kind of, you know, God talk. God shouted at me. Uh, you know, I, I, I heard the audible voice of God uh, bizarrely. And this has never happened to me before or since. And I'm a very kind of conservative guy when it comes to my theology. So it freaked me out. Uh, um, I'm not from that kind of, that's not something which happens to me regularly. But I was in this worship service and I had a, I just had a, had a picture in my, in, in my mind as I was praising uh, the, the Lord of, um, of, of, of a prostitute in the red light district in Cardiff. And I audibly heard the voice of God shouting, go and rescue her, go and rescue her, go and rescue her. And I burst into tears. Nothing like that has ever happened to me before or since. And mm-hmm. long story short, I drove to that area that night expecting to have to rescue someone and there was no one there. So I actually just then started to ask the question, okay, well, what was what was that about? And we thought maybe the Lord was just trying to draw my attention, catch my attention to the issue, the wider issue of, pro- of, of prostitution, exploitation in Cardiff. And it, you know, through the, lead, the, the guidance of local church, uh, through the through guidance of trusted friends, the scriptures being open, um, it led us back to Cardiff. We were living in the valleys at the time um, in Pontypool, where I was leading a church I'd planted. Um, but now we're back in the inner city in Cardiff. And part of what I'm doing is, uh, you know, the kind of the anti-trafficking stuff. The other part is, I've, you know, I'm leading a church in the inner city all off the back of that crazy moment, which even now I, I, I talk back about that. It's almost a decade ago, but and it still feels weird saying it because I know for mm-hmm. some people that just sounds totally ridiculous, but mm-hmm. it happened. And so I well, let's go back to the very beginning. Tell us about your upbringing. Was it in Wales? Yeah, so um, born and raised in a town called Pontypool, um, which is in the South Wales Valleys in the Eastern Valley, about 10 miles north of Newport. Um, two Christian parents, um, my mum and my dad, uh, both very different, and I learned a lot of different things from them. My mother, unquestionably the most gracious, prayerful, gentle, wonderful woman I've ever known. Um, you know, so many people, you know, uh, my, my mom's now with the Lord. She died um, quite a few years ago, um, about 12 years ago. Now I think she died. Mm. But um, yeah, but she's just a, a wonderful woman. And I learned so much about her, not least um, learn what it looks like just to walk humbly before the Lord. I don't think I do anything like as good a job as she did, but she was not, you know, she, she wasn't presumptuous. She wasn't pushy. She never, you know, hogged the limelight. She just served faithfully um, and humbly and prayed man man she she prayed i, I you know I, I learned so much about prayer from her um mm. my dad on the other hand um had a very rough upbringing in the slums of salford um and so uh he was he's he's, he's a christian uh, very very sincere faith but i had a very different kind of experience with my dad he was a kind of like the straight talking disciplinarian in, in the home and i probably mm. um, had more more of the wrong kind of words from him than I you know <laughs> I should have but you know I needed to be kept on the straight and narrow because I was a bit of a rogue I'll get to that in a minute but what I did get from my dad is a huge lust for adventure my dad um is always wanted to be outdoors doing crazy things whether that's you know walking extreme mountains caving mountaineering whitewater canoeing paragliding he just uh, I, so I guess if you put the two together, what I've got is a real love for Jesus and a real desire for adventure. And I mm. think that's probably my parents' um, responsibility. And I thank God for both of their roles um, in my life. As I said, mm. as a teenager, especially, I was... It a, sounds as though things went wrong, yes. Yeah, I mean, the the tendency with these sorts of things is to make the bad part sound really bad, you know, and sort of like to try and like, you know, over-egg the pudding a little bit. 
and I know next to some of the people you know uh, that might, might be watching this, I probably wasn't that bad at all. But certainly by the standards that my parents raised me under, you know, and the way that you know they would have wanted my life to have gone, the the biggest thing I remember being an issue with my life is rage. I had a real anger problem, so I was a really angry kid, and I don't know why, um, because I didn't have re- didn't have a, a lot of reasons to be angry. I was well loved. I was well provided for. Do you know what I mean? I got bullied a bit in school, and so perhaps some of it was a response to that. But you know, I would punch doors, punch walls. My my words were very um, weaponized, and I would you know I'd hurt people uh, with with my words regularly, including not least my mother. Um, and I was just a very angry kid, you know. And I I remember um, one point my dad said to me. And it's funny because this these these words have kind of haunted me ever since. They followed me everywhere I've gone. But my, my dad said to me, he said, boy, your accent is going to cause you problems in later life. You sound thick and you sound aggressive. And <laughs> um, and like it was almost like a prophecy, which, you know, because I was like, well, you, you, you brought me up in Pontypool. Everyone <laughs> sounds like this in Pontypool. So like, <laughs> do you know what I mean, if you if you knew the Gwent Valleys, we all sound like we want to fight. Um, <laughs> And so, but it's true. And so even now people think I'm angry when I'm not. People think that I want to fight when I don't. Um, and that the skinhead doesn't help now. <laughs> you, well, but, you choose that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That, and that's, that's definitely chosen. But, um, you know, and like, I sometimes shave my beard off and my kids say, with the beard, I look homeless. And with the, without the beard, I look like a football hooligan. So either way, <laughs> I, you know, I got, kind of got, but, you know, I'm not that person now. But when I was a teenager, I was angry. And I, you know, I, and, and I wasn't really angry. I was I was a little wretch, you know, I, I know some people don't like being told that they're sinners or they don't like being told there's things that are wrong in their lives, but I got no problem looking back at my life and saying, you know what, there was some stuff in my heart that came out of my mouth, that came out of my hands, that came out of my, you know, m- m- the thought processes that I had, there was something really messed up. And I was, I was a sinner. I was wretched. I really was. And, um, the older I got, um, the more that kind of manifested itself really. Um, you know, I, I did a lot of things even by the age of 15, that I really regretted through the way I treated people, the way I treated girls, the way that I um, spoke to my mother, you know, I stole things. Um, and part of it was attention seeking part of it, part of it was trying to sort of, I, I think it often happens in school. If you're bullied for being a bit different, you just sort of join the bullies a little bit. And I think I went from being one of the kids that perhaps had things that were a bit different. And so I just kind of went the opposite way to try and fit in and to try and, you know, not be, the one that people picked on. And so, mm-hmm. as I say, I don't over egg the pudding compared no. to a lot of kids. I don't think I, I was never at risk of going to jail. I was never like, you know, in trouble with the police. I, I was chased by the police a couple of times, but like, you know, but just for, for petty, stupid things. Um, I, I was never going to be, be a raging alcoholic, although I didn't handle drink well, you know, none of that stuff, but there was, there was anger inside me and there was, and what happened off the back of that. And a lot of the decisions that I made, was there then became a lot of self-hatred. I would often go to bed, put mm-hmm. my head on the pillow and not like the person that I was becoming. I got real mm-hmm. strong memories of coming home, uh, you know, on a Friday night when all my friends weren't around me anymore or the girl that I'd been with wasn't with me anymore. I just put my head on the pillow and just thinking, I, I, I actually hate myself. I don't like who I'm mm-hmm. becoming. I'm thinking, what would my mom think if she really knew what her mm-hmm. boy was doing and how he was, was behaving? Guy, were, my- you, were, were you going to church at this time while all this was going on? Yeah, a good question. So like, yes, I was kind of. Um, so my, 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 I think my parents made a very brave decision with me. And I'm not saying that this is what I would suggest all, all Christian parents do. I think every Christian uh, family has to find the right way for, for them to to work. But um, man, that's a big tank of there, Rog. That was a good question. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so my parents, I think, recognized in my character a real rebellious streak. And I went to a chapel, a, a kind of a nonconformist chapel in the valleys. Um, and, I, and there was two services, a morning service and an evening service. And I think they knew that if they started trying to force me to go to church twice on Sunday, that wasn't going to go well. Mm. Um, I think as well, they probably um, didn't want to force me to, to, to do anything. Because I, I think, you know, they didn't want me to start acting like a Christian if I wasn't. And, no. um, and so they, they almost gave me the kind of freedom to sort of work out where I stood with that stuff. I clearly had a kind of an understanding of certain things. 
Um, one of the stories that my mom tells is that when I was a, a small child, really young, um, we had chickens in the back garden. We had a sloping garden. And one day I was running down the garden with some, uh, some lettuce leaves for the chickens. And I tripped over and landed in a massive um, patch of stingy nettles, oh. covered head to toe in stings. And like I was crying my eyes out. And my dad came running down and he said, he p- picked me up and he said, it's a really good job you didn't give those lettuce leaves to the chickens because they're covered in weed killer. It would have killed them. And oh. apparently as a small child, I verbalized, God hurt me to save the chickens, just like he hurt Jesus to save us. Oh, wow. mm. So I clearly had some kind of understanding of gospel mm. stuff, but the older I got, it was up there. It wasn't in there. And so I was going to church once on Sunday, but I also started playing squash very competitively um, as well. At the age of about 11 or 12, I started playing squash for my county and then for Wales. And so I was often away on weekends in squash mm. tournaments mm. and stuff. Um, and so I wouldn't be in church on those Sundays mm. either. Um and even with a youth club on a Friday night, there's a church youth club, which I just thought was sad. And I'd rather be out on the streets with my friends. And so my parents didn't force me to go to the church youth club. Mm-hmm. They said I had to go to a different sort of youth club. So they said I could go to the local council run youth club. So I would literally, this is what I would do um, to kind of show you the kind of conflict within me. I didn't want to lie to my parents. So I'd walk to the council youth club, go, put my foot across the threshold so I could say I'd been. And then go out on the streets and cause, you know, mischief. Um, so, and then my, my parents would say, did you go to youth club? Yeah, I did. How was it? Yeah, it was great. You know, um, and I'd, obviously, and to my mind, I wasn't quite lying because I'd put my mm-hmm. foot across the door frame, but I wasn't really going there and I wasn't going to church youth club. Um, and I was lying and I was dishonest and they were the sort of things that I just sort of increasingly had a disquiet about in my spirit, but I just wanted to be with, with my mates doing them things. And so stop going to church apart from, in, I was there physically, but certainly, certainly not there spiritually. Mm. Um, I'm sure your mother and father were praying for you. Oh, uh, do you know, one of the maddest things that happened to me after I, after I became a Christian is I started going to the church prayer meetings and it wasn't just me. I, I, I wasn't the only kid in church that wasn't following Jesus and was going down some bad paths. But when I started going to prayer meetings, because I become a Christian and I really wanted to pray, I wanted to be you know with God's people whenever then I was at morning service, evening service, prayer meeting, youth club, everything after that. But <laughs> I go to the prayer meeting and I would hear all the parents praying for their kids and each other's kids. Mm. And I got a real insight into what my man must have been going through and my dad and like other parents even now will probably go through. And I, and I, I passionately believe that every Christian is a product of someone's prayer. Yeah. Do you yeah. know what I mean? Mm. And my mother was very patient and gracious with me. I kind of, I mean, one of the worst things for my mom is she was a teacher in my school. And as I got <laughs> older, I got, you know, in high school or comprehensive school as I was in, my behavior got worse and worse and the teachers would be talking about my behavior in the staff room. And my, my mom would walk in and, you know, and m- most of the naughty kids had a letter sent home. My letter just got sent straight to the staff room. <laughs> yes. It was a nightmare. So like, you know, my, my, there was no way I could hide what I was doing <laughs> at school. You know, my mom knew about it before I'd even got home. Well, so, um, yeah, she saw the worst of that, but she prayed and she prayed yeah. faithfully. Um, and her, her, her and my dad, I think, both truly believed that if you raise up a child in the way it should go when they're old they will not depart from it um and mm. i think they really believe at some point god was going to get his hands on me and how did he do that when was that mm. so one of the friday so i would go to the council youth club or <laughs> the council youth club and be on the streets when it was, yes. it was dry yes. if it was raining i'd go to the church youth club pretty much um and so on one of the, the wet nights of which with there are several um, it's in south wales definitely south wales, you know i mean <laughs> there's not often you can be on the street and stay dry um i went to the to the the, the church youth club um probably as, as much as anything just to see if there's any you know pretty girls there or whatever like you know I, I certainly wasn't in any way you know looking for the lord um and the, there's a guy there a friend of mine called warren and he said to me he said anki do you want to go on a camp in the summer? And I was like, what's a camp? I never, you know, I didn't know what a camp was. Mm. I, um, and so I was like, well, what's that? He said, oh, you know, you go to North Wales and, you know, you 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 stay in this house and they, they got loads of sports and activities. I was like, well, look, I live by Pontypool Leisure Centre. It's the best leisure centre in the UK. <laughs> like, why would I want to go to North Wales um, to do sport? Like, you know, I play squash for Wales and I got a leisure centre right by here. I, I could do sport. And he said, oh, and there'll be girls there. I said, oh, in that case, yeah, I'm in. Um, <laughs> So literally, um, I was go. I, I agreed to go because I wanted, you know, to see if there's any young ladies there. Really. Wasn't okay, so this was a Christian camp, presumably. Christian camp EMW Brinnagross. That's, that's the evangelical movement of Wales. Yes. Yeah, okay. that's right. Yeah. 
Yeah, and there's a big white house called Brinnegroes, and uh, right next to Bala Lake, and uh, that's where I went um, in the summer of 1992. Got on the bus, longest bus journey I've ever been on. You could probably, <laughs> you, you, in all seriousness, you could probably get to Spain from London quicker than you can get <laughs> from Montreal to to Bala on that bus. It took about eight hours or ten hours, and it? it was mad. <laughs> Um, and I got there and literally I was on a two prong mission. I wanted all the girls to fancy me. I wanted all the boys to be scared of me. That was it. Like, um, <laughs> there was nothing in me looking for the Lord, nothing in me thinking, all right, and God prove yourself to me. I had nothing of that going on, but this was one of those camps really uncool. And like, you know, I'm increasingly convinced that uncool Christianity is the best sort of Christianity. Um, just like, but faithfully opening the Bible at any given opportunity. There's an elderly chaplain must be in his sixties, maybe even seventies called Owen Jones. And, um, you know, Owen would open the Bible in the morning. He would teach it. He'd explain it. Then you go and do some activities. Then you go back to your dorm and discuss the morning's Bible study. Then you'd have, you know, um, some lunch. Then you'd go and do some more activities. Then you'd, you'd have Bible in the evening and then a dorm discussion in the evening. It was like wherever you went, there was like, you know, and it, I, I can't remember the, I can't r fully remember the details. I remember it was like the book of um, one Chronicles. That's what I remember, which is not like, <laughs> which is not most evangelists go to. Um, but the whole week was a series of stuff from, from the book of one Chronicles. But by the, so I arrived on the Saturday and I was sitting under this teaching. And all I can say to you, Roger, is that like at some point during those few days, I started realizing that the reason that I hated myself, the reason there was rage, the reason that I was actually not in right standing with God, that like my life was not right before God. And I started to feel really convicted that I wasn't living as I should. I started feeling really convicted. I started to believe that if I was to die in that state, I would not be with the Lord in heaven, but I would be punished in hell, um, judged. Mm -hmm. And I started to really believe that. And I have a very clear memory. And like, this is a funny memory, okay? Because on the Tuesday morning, they had a camp photo where everyone has to sort of stand in front of the camera and they get a photograph, which is, you know, this is before digital cameras, yeah? So they had to take the photograph on the Tuesday so all the photographs could be developed <laughs> when you go home on the, on the Saturday. So on the Tuesday morning, I remember I'm standing, you know, I've got, got my urine in, my shaved, you know, shaved down the side here freshly. And I, I start standing with a chair in front of me and I thought, I'm going to stick my, my middle finger over the back of the chair. So like, you know, for, for my memory, memory is going to be die was flipping the birds at the whole camp that was my kind of attitude on the tuesday morning was like you know you know this is me you know bad boy sort of thing mm. the, whatever happened on that tuesday day um i remember the tuesday evening i just said to my dorm officer after the evening bible study can i please talk to you um and we sat on a wall just down the driveway in brinner Grice, and it's a wall that i regularly go back and visit whenever <laughs> i'm back in North wales i go and sit on it and i thank god for it because on that wall I just prayed. I, co I confessed my sin to the Lord. I said, Lord, I'm sorry for my life. I'm sorry for what I've done. I'm sorry for who I am. I'm sorry for all of this. But I believe that you love me. Mm. I believe that Jesus died for my sins. I believe that all the things I've done, the things I've stolen, the, the, the things I've hit, the, the, the people I've, I've, I've mistreated, the teachers I've you know, given breakdowns to, and I had, um, all those things. I believe Jesus, you died so that I don't need to beat myself up for that anymore. And, I, and I'm mm. sorry. And I ask, and I believe that he, I believe that you're alive and I believe you can change me. And if you want me, you can have me. It was something like that. Not a full on, like, you know, it was, it was, I definitely remember that if you want me, you can have me part of the prayer. Uh, mm. But there's also a very strong awareness that I was sinful, but that Jesus had died so that I could mm. be right with God. And I was crying my eyes out, man. I cried on that wall. And as I look back, I think I was crying for two reasons. One is I kind of was feeling really guilty and there's a lot of like emotion tied up in who I was and how I'd lived. So there's a lot of tears over that. But I, th I genuinely think it felt, and as I reflected on it over the years, I, I kind of felt like I was at my own funeral. Hmm. I felt like I was saying goodbye to my old life. I knew there were things that were, go that were going to change when I went back friendships that had to stop a relationship that I was in, you know, with, with, with a Muslim girl that I knew just probably wasn't, you know, going to be, you know, appropriate, you know, and what wasn't going to last in light of the fact that I now wanted to go full on for Jesus. Mm. Um, and I, and I just kind of like knew that my old life was passing away before my eyes. And I kind of was crying a little bit because I, I knew I, I was very aware that I wasn't just making a decision to trust Jesus. I was making a decision for my life to change the trajectory mm -hmm. of my life, everything that I valued, everything that I stood for was now very much op over to him. 
And when I got off that wall, I was changed hundred percent. Like, you know, that uh, some people have a story where there's a, you know, a lot of like mis- links in the chain. Mine was a very yeah. short story. It really started on the Saturday night. Um, and it, you know, and by, by the, by the Tuesday night I was his. I'm and uh, trying to reflect on it now, Di, what was happening during the day on Tuesday? Do you think? <sighs> I just think I what they were saying made sense from the Bible. Mm. This really uncool preacher, if I can say that, like not a, not not a uh, not an edgy, cool, hip pastor, just a faithful dude of the Bible, but also a really helpful, gracious, and kind dorm officer who was closer to my age, who could then mm. help me and the other guys in the dorm to apply those truths. Um, it just it, it was just the, the the word was going in making sense it was con- first it was convicting me of sin but it didn't leave me hopeless because i knew that when i prayed and asked god for his forgiveness i wasn't just saying i'm sorry with nowhere to go i was i knew exactly where to go by tuesday it was to the cross and so i knew that there was a loving god more than happy to forgive me because of what christ had done um so yeah uh, by the wednesday morning i was a, you know I, I was completely different it's yeah. a tremendous story. What happened when you went back to Pontypool? Um, certainly my life changed. I, I kind of pendulum swung. I'm a bit of a, I, I'm one of those sorts of people anyway, like, you know, I, I'm a high, you know, I, I swing hard. And so I went from being a kid who didn't want to be in church to a kid in church in a silk tie and a waistcoat. Um, <laughs> you know, to this day, I can't believe that happened, but I kind of thought, well, <laughs> everyone else seems to wear these things in church. So I should probably do that as well. I was in church every given opportunity. I, I got given, or uh, rather I bought rather on that camp some books. I bought a book that was this thick morning and evening by Charles Spurgeon mm-hmm. and I devoured it. Um, I found it really helpful, just bite sized nuggets. You know, it wasn't exegetical. It was like, you know, today we're in the Psalms, tomorrow we're in Matthew, then we're in Habakkuk. You know, it was all over the place, but every single day I just, I was absorbing truth. Mm-hmm. Um, I started wanting to write songs, sing songs, started asking if I could lead songs in the church on a guitar before the service. They wouldn't have let me lead the songs during the service because that would have been nuts if you'd heard me play the guitar at the time. Um, I uh, broke up with that girl. Um, I sent her a letter in German saying, I probably, I don't think we should be together. And she was a German uh, girl. Mm. I think we should probably not be together anymore. I tried saying because I'm a Christian, but I, my German was really bad. So I said, I can't be with you anymore. I am the Christ, uh, which wasn't good. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I don't know what she thought of me, but uh, you know it wasn't. You know, as I look back, that wasn't really helpful for her. Um, I sound like I was, I was starting a cult, I think. Um, but, uh, <laughs> and I tried. I really tried to stand in school and not be as naughty as I was, not be the one that was causing all the trouble with my with my friends. I, I did stop hanging out with them on the streets. I stopped doing all that kind of stuff. My behavior was still struggling in school. I didn't find it easy to just to stop being cheeky, to stop being mouthy, to stop being, you know, troublesome. And, you know, a big break for me came because that, I, I got saved between year 10 and year 11. So my GCSE year, I was trying to live yeah. as a Christian, but still stuck with all the same people around me. And I, you know, I loved those guys, but I just couldn't be around them. Bad company mm-hmm. corrupts good character, as the scripture says. And I just knew I needed a break. So when it came to six form choices, they all went to the, the local college. I went to a sixth form um, five miles away and um, had a fresh start there. I think that's mm-hmm. when I really started to make some progress of like, you know, living and you know as a christian should live but the and, whole and while before, before you became a pastor what were you doing yeah that's a good question so i went to sixth form and even in sixth form i still had issues and i was still uh, you know um naughty and the school i don't think were very impressed with me because it was a bit of a decent sixth form and i was one of the only kids from pontypool that went to it and they told me um that i should probably just forget um about doing a proper academic degree their advice was to aim low great value (laughs) so i settled for a degree in recreation and leisure management um in cardiff uh which was actually great because it meant i didn't have to do any work and i got a free tracksuit with my name on it so that was good (laughs) um but to be honest with you almost as soon as i was saved because i'm mouthy and my teachers got the worst of that but i knew that God wanted me to use my big mouth just to tell people about him. And so I, I think he, whatever degree I would have done, I didn't really expect it to lead me to a lifetime vocation in anything. Mm. So I think what God just did is he wanted me to get to the capital city. He wanted me to meet my wife. He wanted me to you know, be a part of a good, healthy local church. He wanted me to connect with uh, people that would help me to you know, uh, take next steps in becoming a, you know, a, a preacher of the gospel. Um, and you know, long before I was 
paid to do it. I was still do. I just wanted to share what Christ had done with me with whoever would listen, you know, and uh, that's always been my, my heart really There's a scripture that means so much to me in uh, Romans 15, where Paul says, it's always been my ambition to preach the gospel where Christ is not known. Mm. And I think for me, that was, that, that became a life verse long before it was a, you know, my ministry. Mm. So, yeah, so I was a student. Then I, w- I started working for Highfields Church as a, um, a detached youth worker, like with the lo- lo- kids on the streets and going to Cardiff Prison and doing work with the inmates in there. Always had a heart for taking the gospel to where people aren't. Um, and so that's what I was doing. And then, yeah, uh, I think in 2000, uh, 2002, I went to a council estate, worked for a church there on a, a, a really rough estate in East Cardiff. Went from there to Pontypool, my hometown, and planted a church up there. Uh, I was pastoring that for nine years until the Lord, with that miraculous intervention, which I referenced earlier, called me back Mm. to Cardiff again to plant Redeemer, which is where I'm now uh, living and serving. Amazing. Now, um, just quickly, any any outstanding stories from these people you've been working with who are caught up in modern day slavery? Any any I don't know. You sort of think, wow, you know, I've been through some tough times doing all of this, but but I remember this person or that person and it was worth it all for them. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, there's one guy in particular, uh, we, we, we were running a, a coffee training course and, um, he, he, he turned up at it and he was, uh, really quiet and shy. He was quite fresh out of his horrendous ordeal being trafficked into cannabis cultivation from the far East. Um, but he, uh, it transpired, he lived in my community. So we just started going for bike rides and, having a coffee together he couldn't speak any english and so it was very difficult most of our conversations were done through google translate oh, right. <laughs> yeah but he just became a very very close friend a very dear friend of me and of the family you know um he would regularly come over and cook us noodles um he would regularly come over and spend time with the computer games with our kids or you know play table football with them um his um his, his trafficking claim had been you know proven he was he was seen by the government to be a trafficking survivor but um, his asylum state status wasn't settled. He was seen, he, uh, so he was told by the Home Office, you probably can't stay. Um, so we just got alongside him, cared for him. Um, and during which time, he started to get involved in the, the, the local church, became a real you know, um, uh, precious kind of part of what we were doing at, at the local mm-hmm. church. He, he, he um, got moved to my street, incredibly, by the council. So like, you know, mm-hmm. they, he lived just down the road from me. Um, during that time, he came to faith. You know, we baptized him, uh, which was amazing. And then finally, I, I went through all his asylum kind of stuff with him, all the solicitors meetings, you know, um, saw him go from like feeling really heavy and really broken to feeling really kind of like hopeful. Uh, at one point, he even said that like now he had Christ. He, he, he trusted that whatever the, the government decided, he was going to be okay because, you know, he was trusting Christ, which was amazing. And then when he finally did get... Um, the green light from the government to stay in the UK. One of the most beautiful things that um, uh, happened was the judge wrote a letter saying, we can't send him back to, you know, his home country for this reason, this reason, this reason. And here in the UK, he had, you know, cause he, he, he didn't have family or his, his family had died when he was a kid. So he was an orphan. Wow. And so um, they said, you know, we can't take him away from the UK. We can't take him away from the local church, which is the only family he's got. And the only thing even, even slightly resembling a family that he's ever known. Mm. And it just blessed me that like, He'd come to not only, you know, um, trust, you know, the, the Lord for himself, but like the local church had really become what the local church should mm. be. You know, mm. so, um, you know he's, he's still with us. He's, you know, he's still working through stuff the same as we all are. Um, but he's, you know, he's still around. And um, that, that, that to me, and I remember the day he got the phone call to say he could stay in the UK. He, I was actually having a coffee with him and one of the other pastors in the church. And he just like, just gave me this biggest hug, just crying his eyes. That was such, oh. joy, such relief. Um, so yeah, th- those sorts of stories that, you know, um, stand, s- stand out. I'm sure they do. Yes. Yeah, wonderful. You've got four children of your own. How old are they? Um, my eldest is a, a, a daughter. She's 15. I've got a son who's 13 and a pair of 11 year old twins, a boy and a girl. So we've got two of each. Amazing. And are they, any of them going the way you were going? I don't think so. Not yet. I mean, they, as everyone, I'm sure they've. Yeah got their struggles and they have they're not they're certainly not manifesting themselves in the way that mine did they're far more respectful mm-hmm. and far more pleasant than i was um uh, but yeah i mean we're, we're trying to sort of just 
commend Christ to them by the way we live, by the way that we we love, by you know we the stuff they're learning in schools these, these days. They often come home with like you know the school said this. What do you think? And we have amazing conversations with them about mm-hmm. that. They, mm-hmm. We try to draw them into hospitality. You know, we open up our home to people that you know we feel the Lord wants us to invite in. You know, including this guy I was just talking about, who they yeah. know, his brother. And we're trying just trying to help them see the gospel. You know, being lived out um, in the way that it needs to be lived out. You know. Now, die children's books. Tell us more. How did you get into that? Oh, that was weird. Um, so I'd written a couple of little, just tiny gospel tracts, gospel like uh, leaflets, um, years ago which the good book company had published. Um, so they, one was aimed at uh, guys, you know, in prison and the other one was aimed at, you know, just sort of like just normal people that have got no kind of gospel compass. But one day in, when I was back in the valleys, back in Pontypool, I got asked to do a harvest assembly um, by the local primary school and I agreed to do it. But then I thought, I don't know what to do. So I phoned a good friend of mine, Pete Hodge. I said, Pete, have you got any ideas for harvest assembly? He's like, well, not really, mate. No, you know, not, not with this short notice. And so I scratched my head and in the end, I just, I decided to write a story in my head of like this little kid called Eric, um, who, um, and I, I, I acted the story out in front of the kids in school. So it was, it was kind of a, a fancy dress thing. I put wigs on hats and coats and stuff. And Eric want, Eric had a piece of toast in the morning, wanted to know who to thank for his toast because he loved it. So he goes and thanks his mum. His mum says, don't thank me, thank the baker. He made the bread. The baker says, don't thank me, thank the delivery guy who brought the flour, et cetera, all the way back to the farmer who says, don't thank me, thank God who sends, you know, the rain and the kind of sun and makes, you know, the grain grow kind of thing. And so it's just a very simple, you know, yeah. if, you, if you're grateful for stuff, your kind of journey of thanks goes all the way back to God who, you know, gives yeah. all the things. And the kids absolutely loved it. I enjoyed telling the story. And like, I randomly, I, I was so excited by the story. I went home and wrote it up as a rhyming story that afternoon. Yeah. I wrote it as a rhyming thing just so it's could it fresh in my mind. And I just sent it to one of the editors at the good book company and said, look, I just done this thing. I don't know if you're interested in kids books. I don't know if you trust me to do kids stories, but I just did this. And they said, yeah, we're going to take a punt on it. If you agree to write two others as well. So I kind of, um, had to write two other kids books. So yeah. Um, I kind of got these three rhyming kids books about this. this lad and, and are you, are you able to rhyme things very easily then? Yeah. That's a weird thing. And like, my kids will tell you it's really irritating and I don't know if it's a wealth thing, <laughs> but I'm constantly making up nonsense rhymes, like nonstop, like in my head all the time, there's always this nonsense rhymes. I did it even as a kid. My mom used to get frustrated by it as well. Um, and so, but you know, it, it often comes out in me singing spontaneous worship songs. It comes you know, on my own in the car or me in the, you know, just like, you know, walking down the street, just like, you know, rhyming my prayers rather than praying my prayers. Um, so yeah, rhyming comes to me really quickly, um, especially nonsense rhyme. I think I would never be at risk of becoming a proper poet, you know, where they're really kind of flowery, <laughs> but like, I think doggerel is what they call it. Like that kind of simple, you know, sort of like, you know, nursery type rhyme comes out of my mouth all the time. And yeah, sometimes the, it, it might be profound. Often it's just really annoying for people. You're not doing, there was an old lady of Ponty pool. This no, nothing like that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Nothing like that. No. We've talked a lot about what you've done, but I think really the focus of what you're wanting to say is what Jesus did for you all those years ago. And uh, it really did totally turn your life around. Do you ever think what you might've been if you hadn't sat on that wall on that occasion and prayed and trusted Christ? Oh, mate. I mean, my, my, my theology now doesn't permit me to go too far down the path of what if that hadn't happened. I believe that had to happen. I believe that that was going to happen. Like, you know, God was going to save me and you can't stop God saving you. So like, but if I, if I allow myself just to journey a little bit down the path of where I would have gone, if um, Christ hadn't intervened when he did, I think that a lot of the things that I do now, the people that I have a heart for helping, I would probably be joining them rather than, you know, you know, I, I would either be, uh, a very abusive person, very, you know, I, I would, I wouldn't be a loving husband. I'd be an abusive husband. I'd be an abusive father. I don't, I don't doubt that whether it's verbally or physically or both. Mm. I don't think I would have treated women well because of the trajectory that I was on. Um, I don't think I would have, um, been a good friend to anyone. I think I would have been very selfish. My whole life would have been about getting what I can and trying to have things, and I just think that the Lord has completely turned that on his head. And that's all because you believe Jesus died for your sin and he rose from the dead. And you came to that moment on that camp all those years ago where you asked him to forgive you and change you. Yeah. And he really did, man. Like, you know, the Holy Spirit came into my life and changed me. He changed my priorities, my principles. And the thing I'm most glad about, because, I mean, I don't want to come on this 
um, podcast thing we're doing now and pretend that I'm perfect or that like since that day, I, the old self hasn't risen up and I haven't made some big mistakes or haven't like, you know, messed up in many, I, I have done and I, and I do, but because the Holy Spirit is with me, my conscience will not allow me to go too many steps down a path of rebellion before something mm. provokes me and just like stabs me in the heart and says, stop. And that's his kindness to me that even now, like, you know, when I feel the pull away from following Christ, whether it's like for, you know, in, in overt ways or just sneaky ways of just like not quite trusting him or just like living for myself a little bit. I just feel that the Lord just like check my spirit and that he doesn't let me go too far down that path. And I know not everyone can say this. And so I'm not saying this is how it should be for all Christians. I don't think, but I can honestly say there's not a single day has gone by where I I've doubted my, my salvation. I've never once questioned hmm. whether or not I'm his. I have questioned many times whether I am a good Christian or not. I've often hmm. thought I'm an absolute rogue and I, I, I don't deserve to be called his child, but I've never once questioned what he did for me on that day. Um, and I, or, and whether I'm his, I, I got absolute rock solid assurance that I'm his. Mm. Um, I'm just grateful that he hasn't left me to sort of wander off too far. You know, I am prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it, you know, prone to leave the God I love. That's very much my, <laughs> my reality. I, I loved that hymn when I first yes. came across that hymn because I was like, man, I know, I know Jesus is awesome, but I feel like that sometimes as well. Mm. But he has taken my heart and he has, you know, sealed it. And I, and I have this by his grace, 30 years on um this rock solid Fantastic. and very quickly your wife um she's a christian obviously yeah. and uh, what what does she do so at the moment she's um she she sort of like serves alongside me um she she doesn't have a a, a job per se she, her job is to do ministry with me um, to, with the children in the community and you know, later on in a few hours time we'll be going down to the chapel building and running a bible study together for like you know new believers and so you know she just basically um is uh, seeking to serve the Lord through um, blessing the members of the church that we're, we're in and ministering into the community as best as she can. Um, yeah, and also we've got four kids in a very busy household. Yeah, I'm she sure you have. Yes, absolutely. Spends a lot of her energy, uh, emotional energy, on just you know looking after them and caring for them. Like, if my kids only had me as a dad, they'd be in so much trouble, man. Like, you know, like I, I, there's certain qualities I don't have. So I just thank God that she's just pouring, you know, the best. But she's years. got five people to look after die that's great <laughs> thank you very much really good to hear your story die and uh the, the lord bless you thank you thanks so much for having me cheers well thank you very much to uh roger and to die isn't that remarkable to hear of god's work in his life and uh whether he looks like a home, homeless man or a football hooligan, he's saved by the, the grace of God and, and lovely to hear him uh, testifying and speaking about that. I've just checked on the 10 of those websites and in fact, you can get all three books there about Eric. Um, Eric says, thanks. Eric says, sorry. And Eric says, please. So do go and have a look at those. Uh, as I said earlier, it's really good to have Alan here with us in Lancashire. So let me hand over to you, Alan. I think he's moved room, so hopefully we won't lose him now. But over to you, Alan. Thank you. Well, we have just heard of a, a life transformed. And uh, I did chuckle a little bit that Di kind of had that kind of hard man persona. He, he wanted the girls to kind of uh, swoon at his arrival but the men to all be intimidated. I found that quite amusing. There are lots of people out there who are still like that. But the amazing thing I thought would die was that he's not like that anymore. You see, he has, uh, he's been changed. Um, he has been liberated. And um, I also um, winced, I think, during some of what he said, when he was talking about slavery in the year 2022. Um, to hear that one in 200 members of the global population are actually enslaved or, or 48 million uh, people really is quite appalling. And when he mentioned that a, a conservative estimate of 13,000 people in the UK are enslaved, um, I was quite frankly um, appalled. We in Britain, of course, were the, the first nation to abolish that that pernicious trade in human flesh. And yet even now on our doorstep, there are enslaved human beings. Now I have a bit of a reputation um, in my house for gathering and collecting 
um, perhaps historical um, items, uh, not, not quite antiques, I'm, I'm not that posh, um, but I, I do have here, um, I don't know if you can say that, see that, um, a pair of, of handcuffs, and uh, I bought these at an auction um, about 10 years ago for about £50. Where did I get the money from? I don't know. But these are genuine, they're from the year 1850, and they come from America. Uh, and isn't it horrific to think that 150 years ago, a real human being's wrist went into there in order that they could be controlled and exploited by another. Well, I'm really glad that there are people like Dai who, although he might not be part of the, the rescue operation to liberate people who are enslaved, but he's there to kind of look after them and trying to accommodate them, which is also really, really important. But the Bible talks about slavery, which was, of course, a, a, a normal day to day concept to people living in the Roman world as a, a picture of sin, a picture of our, our life outside of Jesus Christ. For example, when Paul was writing to the Romans, he talks about us no longer being slaves of sin. Uh, and I'm going to propose this evening that every single human being is a slave to sin. And the only ones who aren't are those who have been liberated and set free by Jesus Christ. And I, I will come back to that. But let me just consider for a few moments what a, what a slave actually is or the characteristics of being an enslaved person. Uh, perhaps like me, every January, you make New Year's resolutions. I, I'm going to improve on this. I'm, I, I'm going to be better with that. And I'm sure those ambitions are perfectly laudable. Um, the, the, the problem is we, we just can't keep them. In fact, perhaps I, I'm coming to the point now whereby I actually don't bother because I know I haven't got the willpower or the self-control to make sure my bathroom is always clean before visitors come, etc. And maybe like Di, you have a problem with your temper and you try your best to keep control of it, but it keeps getting away. Or maybe you, you resolve to eat less cake or, or, or less cheese. I think Di talked about his uh, propensity to go around punching doors. Um, well, try as we, as we might to improve ourselves, we never seem to manage it, do we? You see, a slave does not have control over himself. The internet is a great thing. We are all using it right now. But there, there are many people, I'm afraid, who, who are en enslaved to, to mucky pictures. And they, they find themselves being, being changed to them. They, they, they can't get away. Some people, their, their lack of self-control, it's obvious that they, they can't break, break free from, from the drugs or, or from the booze. Other people's chains are perhaps rather more respectable. They're, they're, they're bitter or, or, or they're, they're full of pride or they're just plain greedy. I, I'm, I'm afraid each one of us is enslaved to something. Um, a slave, secondly, is, is exploited by another person. Um, we, we do even now take advantage of people, do we not? Now, I, I have a day job um, and I have to turn up at my place of employment and I have to do things, some of which I enjoy, some of which I don't. But I do have the option of leaving and I do get paid for it. I'm, I'm, I'm not all um, goodness. Um, I, you know, I, I expect to be paid for my work. Um, but there are people who would exploit. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm sitting next to my telephone, and uh, one of the disadvantages of being in this room is that I'm hoping that telephone won't ring. Um, but uh, I, I keep getting phone calls um, from people on the, the Indian subcontinent, it must be said, telling me they're going to fix my broadband. And I, I, I would be delighted if they did fix it. But I don't actually pay the company they claim to work for. You see, what they're wanting to do is for me to hand over my, my bank details or my credit card details that they can take money off me that I have worked for, but I get nothing in return. That really is the, the spirit of slavery, exploiting another human being, taking something off them, but giving nothing in return. 
with all due respect to the great religions of the world, they impose upon their followers um, this commandment and that rule and the need to perform that ritual and go on that pilgrimage. And if they do this and do that and do the other, they just might have done enough. Let me tell you tonight, I'm not trying to make you more religious. I'm trying to introduce you to a liberator, to one who can set you free. The, the third characteristic of a, of a slave is that he never really benefits from what he does. One of my favorite books, although it has now been made into a film, is 12 Years a Slave. It's the autobiography of Solomon Northup, who in 1841, he was a black man, but he was a free black man. He, he was drugged and kidnapped. And he found himself chained using you know, like a with a, a pair of handcuffs like like I have just shown you. And he was taken into the deep south where for 12 years he was worked hard. He was beaten. He was whipped. And after that, those 12 years of labor, he received not a single wage. I, I, I don't think the pyramids were, were built by slaves, but the Colosseum in Rome certainly was. And uh, I think on that final day when the, the final brick was laid, did the slaves who had been working on it all that time kind of sit back and go, wow, I helped to build that? You know what? I don't think they did. I think they were too busily being moved on to the next labor project. You see, they had no part in the Colosseum. They, they, they had no, no, no benefit from it. People all over the world are, are working their socks off to try and impress gods, but they're being exhausted by it. The favorite hymn of mine is Rock of Ages by Augustus Top Lady. Not the labor of my hands can fulfill thy law's demands. Could my zeal no respite know? Could my tears forever flow? All for sin could not atone. Thou must save and thou alone. If you're following some religious ritual or formula today, in order to get to heaven, you're being exploited. You can go to heaven. You can be right with God, but you have to be liberated by the great liberator first. Finally, that the slave has nothing to look forward to. The slave inherits nothing um, and he gets nothing. Um, I am paying into a pension fund. I've got to that age in life where I'm actually beginning to find pensions more interesting than I did 20 years ago. It might be that you're already claiming your pension. So you, you, you worked for it all your life. You paid money in. Maybe your employer did as well so that you might have 10, 20, 30 years of, of a, basically enjoying yourself. But the slave gets no such thing to look forward to. There, there is no pension for the slave. He has nothing to look forward to but, but drudgery and hardship. Job observes in chapter 7 and verse 2, like a, a slave who longs for the shadow, like a hired hand who looks for his wage. The hired hand looks forward to the money he's going to receive. The only thing the slave can look forward to is the shadow at the end of the day in which he can fall asleep before the next day's toil begins. Well, Jesus Christ is the great liberator. We heard that great reading from Galatians before. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Now, in the Roman world, if you, if you had a slave and you set him free, um, he, he didn't become a, a citizen straight away, but rather he was called a, a freed man. So imagine a scenario in which you are owned by a cruel master, but another comes along who wants to set you free. And he, he spends a fortune to buy you. And then having bought you, he sets you free and he'd give you a special certificate and you would be classed as a freedman. Now, as his freedman, you were no longer a slave, but you were still committed to him. There was still a kind of a, a bond, a special relationship between the one who had set you free. And when you become a Christian, you are released from slavery, but you become the freed man or woman of Christ. In other words, 
you're free from slavery, but you're now committed to him. The freed man is, is in control, and yet he's somehow obliged to serve another. When you become a Christian, you're not just left to kind of curl up in a corner or die under a bush. You spend the rest of your life living for other people and living for him. The freed man is enriched by serving Christ. As a slave, he had no wealth. As a freed man, he's actually enriched. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 11, 29, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. It, it might be that you know that you are a slave tonight. You know you're, 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 you're chained by this and you're chained by that. And Jesus is prepared to set you free. But he doesn't just set you free and then ignore you. He, he wants to have a relationship with you. The freed man, unlike the slave, benefits from what he does. Again, Jesus said in Revelation 22, behold, I am coming quickly and my reward is with me. Now, let me make it absolutely clear. Heaven is not a reward. It's not a payback. It's not a wage. It's a free gift. And you receive it freely or you don't receive it at all. And yet, by becoming a Christian, the Lord Jesus promises to share with you all his glory and wealth in heaven. As a slave, you have nothing. But as the freed man and woman of Christ, you have everything. I said before, a, free, a slave has nothing to look forward to apart from a, a shadow or a, a poor bed at the end of the day. But as a freed man or woman of Christ, you have everything to look forward to. You know, during the, the late lockdown, a great many people made it clear they were afraid to die. And maybe a few Christians were, were a bit wobbly as well in, in, in that department. But let me assure you, as a, a Christian, you, you've no fear of death. You've everything to look forward to. In Revelation 21, we read, God will wipe away all tears from their eyes and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any pain for the former things are passed away. I want to invite you tonight to consider Jesus Christ, the great liberator. Well, whatever is, is chaining you, whatever is holding you back, weighting you down, be it a guilty conscience, a, a, a sinful habit, or maybe it's just fear of dying. Maybe it is all the weight placed upon you by man-made religion. Jesus Christ has come to set you free. That was part of his mission. He's come to free you from sin, free you from guilt, that you might serve him and share eternity with him. In a moment, I'm going to pray. And it might be that if Dai's testimony has spoken to you tonight, you can pray this with me. I'm also going to pray for the situation in Ukraine, because there are a great many people in that country tonight who are in dire need. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you that the Lord Jesus came, that we who were enslaved and enthralled to iniquity might be released, set free, liberated, and adopted into your royal family. Lord, set us free tonight. We pray, Lord, for the people of Ukraine. We pray that you might stay the hand of the, the violence. We pray that you might keep those children safe. 
And Lord, if it be possible, I pray there, there might be reconciliation. But Lord, for now, I, I just pray that you might cause the, the missiles and the fighting to stop. Lord, I pray for everybody in this meeting tonight. Lord, for the Christian and perhaps the one who's not yet there. Lord, I pray that tonight you will set people free. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, David. Well, thank you very much to you, Alan, for uh, sharing with us and pointing us to the one who can set us free from our sin and make us right with God. Uh, do get in touch with us if we can be of further help. Uh, it'll be up on the screen at the end, but you can go to reallives.net. You'll find a contact form there. Do get in touch with us and uh, we can send you a Bible or part of the Bible or uh, other Christian uh, Book. So please uh, get in touch with us via the website. Um, we'd love to help you if we can. Um, and there you'll find links to previous interviews as well. There's all sorts of fascinating interviews with all kinds of people, all sorts of people whose lives have been changed uh, by Jesus. That's all for tonight. Do remember those and uh, in Ukraine uh, and in Russia as well and pray for that situation. Uh, call upon the Lord for that. We'll finish uh, as ever with Gus singers singing us out. Do stay and enjoy listening to Gus. Good night and God bless each one of you. There's a way back to God from the dark paths of sin. A door that is open and you may go in. An old wooden cross is where you begin when you come as a sinner to Jesus and all that can stop you is your foolish pride won't you admit that you've cheated and lied but that is the reason the dear Savior died so come as a sinner to Jesus won't you come as a sinner to Jesus peace and forgiveness the satisfied mind the sum of the treasures of heaven you'll find so leave what is hateful and hurtful behind and come as a sinner to Jesus There's a way back to God from the dark paths of sin A door that is open and you may go in At Calvary's cross is where you begin When you come as a sinner to Jesus won't you come as a sinner to Jesus please come as a sinner to Jesus